Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8. One verse, and I'll give you some context. It says, Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, Do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. So I will do to my, for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. I want you to pay attention to a phrase in this verse that the new wine is found in the cluster. Do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. Then I want to look at Luke chapter 5, verse 33, a parable that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. It says, Then they said to him, Luke 5, 33, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And he said to them, Can you make friends of the bridegroom fast when the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. He spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. No one puts new wine into an old wineskin, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Verse 39. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. I thank you that your spirit is moving in this place. I ask you, Spirit of the living God, to illuminate your word into the hearts of your people. Lord, even if I misstumble over a word, if I happen to say something incorrectly, Lord, I know that you're God enough that you're able to take my word and translate it into their ear to hear exactly what they need to hear today. We need to hear from you, great shepherd. We thank you today. We give you praise and honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. And everybody said, Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. Go ahead, put that smile on your face. We're glad that you're here today. How many of you enjoyed the last couple of weeks when we were talking about sacred cows? Right? I figured that would hit home for the farmers in the room. We talked about sacred cows and and I only did two messages in that. We're going to use that throughout the summer to fill in some gaps and things. And so I'll be bringing that back around from time to time. But this morning, we're going to start something <clears throat> in totally brand new tonight. And even on Wednesday night, I'm starting a teaching on uh, spiritual warfare and wars in the heavenlies and what's going on in the spiritual realm that you can't see right now. So it'll be a good time to come and study and get taught up and, and to see exactly how we need to pray and how we need to battle in the realm of the Spirit. So I would encourage you to come and be a part of that. But this morning, I'm going to start a brand new series, and I think they have the graphic on the screen entitled Old School. Everybody say Old School. Now, I love this graphic. The guy who does these for me, I love the way that he made it because it really embodied what I was trying to say. And um, as we look at this over the next couple of weeks, which, by the way, Mother's Day is next week, and we want you to, to uh, invite uh, your mom, if she's still alive, somebody who's a mother figure in your life, a spiritual mother. And we're going to look at a mother's influence um, upon the life of the church. There are even some single women in the days of the Assemblies of God birthing out of the Azusa Street Revival that were instrumental in birthing this movement that we're a part of today. So it's going to be great, and uh, it's going to be a good time. Everybody will benefit. So we want you to come. But we're going to look at what it means to be old school. Partic particularly, I want to endeavor to highlight some things that are old school to some people, but yet necessary to see a move of God in this generation. So today, I've entitled this message, A Move in the Making. Come on, can you say that with me? A Move in the Making. You know, I want to ask you a question. When you think of or you hear the word old school, what do you think of? What comes to mind? I've got some pictures on the screen that I want to show you this morning. Here's the very first one. Is that what? An eight-track tape. Now, for some of the young people in the room this morning, they're looking at this like a cow staring at a new gate. 
what in the world is an 8-track tape? If you can believe it, this used to be the standard mode of operation on listening to music in radios all around the world. When I was born, my parents had a Ford Rambler. It's an old car. They don't even make them anymore. It was an amazing car. It was bright yellow, and it had, they had taken the horn out of it, and it had, instead of going beep, beep, it went hooga. It was pretty cool to have in Southern California. But it had an 8-track tape player in it. And I remember these things because when I was 5 and 6 years old going to kindergarten, my parents had a hard time letting go of these things. And we had them in boxes and we had them all over the place and they were staticky and they didn't always sound good and they were clunky. And, but how many of you know that was the mode of operation for the day in which they lived? Right? So, some of you may think of something like this. And what about, anybody remember bell bottoms? Anybody remember those? Well, here, let's stay here. Let, yeah, bell bottoms, right here. When I think of old school, I think of bell bottoms. Now, isn't it interesting, though, that this is kind of coming back into style? I saw some of our youth wearing those the other day, and I thought, man, you know, you're just a, you just were born out of season. But the truth is, is that things are coming back around. Then, what about, go back to the one you went to first. What about this hairdo? How many of you ever remember somebody with a hairdo like this? The beehive hairdo. I want you to think of somebody right now that you remember who had a hairdo like this. But here's the next one that gets me. Come on, put this next one on the screen. Yeah. Do y'all know who that is? That's Napoleon Dynamite, but this picture is not even about him. I want you to look to the left. Do you see that thing hanging on the wall? <laughs> now what you can't see in the picture is that the cord of that thing was like 36 feet long. And houses had a phone, usually in a centrally located area. And if you wanted to talk privately, come on somebody, to your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you had to drag that long phone cord all over the house. And if you happen to have two phones and your parents wanted to hear what you were talking about, they would just pick up the phone, come on somebody, and hold it. You know what I'm talking about. When I think of old school, I think of stuff like this. And see, the thing is, is that when you look at the 8-track, when you look at the beehive, when you look at the bell bottoms, and when you look at the long corded phone, what happens is in a certain group of people, these types of imageries bring in a sense of nostalgia. Remember those days. Remember how cool that was. Maybe you remember the car you drove. Maybe you remember that the phone calls. Maybe you remember that hairdo or going out with those spell bottoms and, and whatever. For one generation, it is nostalgia to the core. But to another generation, it's like, what in the world is that? Why did you ever wear that? Mom, like really, like you start looking. Have any of you ever started looking at picture albums with your kids or your grandkids and they're like, why did you wear that? Like, why were you dressed like that? Listen, I've got news for you young people. They think the same thing about you. <laughs> because your tastes are much different than their tastes were. But there's a sense of nostalgia that happens when we look at what society did in a previous generation. So the word old school, it, it connotates different ideas for different people. Now, I pulled some pictures when I start thinking about old school, I, I, I think about different things as far as the church is related. I want you to throw this next slide up, this first slide of revival. I want you to see this. Pull that up if you've got it there. It's very cool. There are a couple that are on the screen that I'm going to show you that take us back to an A.A. A. Allen tent revival where there are literally 1,500 or more plus people underneath a gospel tent the lights strung up. and the light. Listen, Pentecostal music all the way back from Azusa Street was so loud, they didn't have to put flyers up. You could hear them from three blocks away. People crowded in underneath the tent with no air conditioner, with nothing. We, and, and they were there for one reason, to experience the power and the presence of God. Go to the next picture. Then what we see a, 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 a Oral Roberts tent in the healing revivals of the 50s. When people would show up and they would bring the sick on a 
stretcher or a bed when the hospitals had given up on them and, and they would see the power of God in demonstration. In South Dallas, there was a man by the name of J.C. Hibbert. He pastored the Lighthouse Church. And it was one of the prominent Pentecostal full gospel churches in the area. And God was so known for what he was doing at the Lighthouse in South Dallas that they would bring the most difficult cases, R.W. Sandbach. They would bring the most difficult cases to the Lighthouse. And the ambulance would stop there on the way to the hospital to see what God might do. And oftentimes, more times than not, the ambulance would have to turn around and go back to the station because the person that they brought would be left changed by the power and the presence of God. Then I believe there's one more that has another part of a crowd where people are laying hands on people and the power of God is falling upon their life. And God is touching them. So when I look at these pictures, and I look at the pictures of the 8-track and the beehive and all of those things, and I begin to think about what is old school, I, I begin to think about how times do change. And listen, while people look at the 8-track and they're like, what is that? How many of you know we still have music today? When people look at the beehive and they say, how crazy is that? How many of you know we got some crazy hairdos today too? When we look at the bell bottoms and we think, what in the world were they thinking? Come on, how many of you know young people today wear pants that they pay $100 for them and it looks like they, they ran through a barbed wire fence being chased after by a grizzly bear? Come on, somebody. We threw them away when they looked like that when I was a kid. I mean, I'm serious. When you look at the different types of things, what you realize is that the base of things never really changes. But the way that it looks, the way that it sounds, and maybe the mode of communication even changes. Because I'm telling you something, as we begin to look at this, I know the Bible says without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe that His miracle working power, His power to save, His power to heal, His power to deliver is not negated to a specific point in time, but yet He desires to do something in every generation. Oh, come on, you missed a good place to say amen right there. My mind is taken back to the days of Jimmy Swaggart and Jerry Lee Lewis's era. And do you know that Jerry Lee Lewis tried to use, that by the way, it's a cousin of Jimmy Swaggart, it was Southwestern, it's Sagu now, but it was Southwestern Bible College back then. He tried to use his gift for God, and they didn't want to hear it. So he took his gift, and he went out to the world with it for a little while. Now, thank God he ended up getting saved. Thank God he gave his life to Christ. But the, the primary thing was, was that his style and his musical taste did not look like the previous generation. And the world got to benefit from somebody's gift that God had designed to be used for His purpose and His kingdom because another generation couldn't receive it. Come on, are you still here? I'm going to preach it this morning. I am loaded for bear today. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8, he says, as thus says the Lord, the new wine is found in the cluster. And one says, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. You know, as we look at this particular aspect, we see that the Holy Spirit is used in the Bible in a typology of new wine. Now, I don't have time to teach you today, but Pentecostals, in which of one I am proud, have always taken the teetotaling stance with alcohol, and I still feel that way. I am 38 years old, and I still believe that Christian people should not drink. Amen. Maybe in a couple of weeks I'll tell you about it. You say, well, Pastor, didn't Jesus turn water into wine? He did. We're going to talk about that today, too. But he turned it into new wine. They said, you've saved the best for last. 
In those days, there was only one harvest of grapes per year. And in order to preserve the grapes all year long, they would go through a process. And those grapes, were, when they were stored, the yeast that would collect on the outside of the grape, when they would go through process, would begin fermentation. And that fermentation caused an effect of gases expanding, causing them to be filled with alcohol. But what, what these modern-day preachers that are not telling you about Jesus drank wine, so it's okay to drink and not get drunk, what they're not telling you is that in biblical days, Jewish people, they diluted the alcohol in the wine, one part wine, to like six to eight parts water. To the fact that even a child could drink the cup at Passover. It'd take like 16 glasses of biblical wine to get a buzz off of one of your little Bahama Mama things people drink today. Come on, somebody. Listen, in fact, I believe what the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be not drunk with wine, where is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, I told you I wasn't going to go there, but I'm going to back up for a moment. So the imagery of new wine at the marriage supper of Canaan, and the imagery of new wine throughout the Bible. Come on, how many of you know the story of the Good Samaritan? He poured in the oil and the wine. Whoo, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And when I begin to look at the passages in the Bible where God is wanting to do something today, we have to look at the fact that God wants to do something in every generation. Come on, how many of you believe that every generation that is ever born deserves to experience a move of God in their generation? I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that young people today need an experience with God at an altar. I believe they need an experience with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the call of God upon their lives to live holy, sanctified unto God, set apart, peculiar unto the kingdom of God. I believe all of that. But what I also have to recognize is that as the eight track look different and the hairstyles look different, I have to think that it may look different in my day. And apparently this was something that the Lord recognized. Because I want you to go back to the passage with me. In Luke chapter 5, verse 33, notice here it says, And they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? So the, the Pharisees are coming to Jesus about his disciples, and here's basically what is being said. Jesus... We worship God differently than you do. So why do your disciples do it that way and we do it this way? Now what you have to understand is that in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were the scholars of the law. They claimed to know God and know the Scripture. The only problem was when the manifested Son of God was standing two feet in front of them, they couldn't recognize Him. I would submit to you that it's possible to know about God, but not to know Him. And Jesus was potentially over and over again trying to show Himself to these Pharisees to let them know. And I love Jesus' explanation. He said, no, no man takes an old garment and cuts off a piece and puts it on a new. Why? Because when you wash that old garment, it shrinks, it stretches, it fades, it, it, it goes to capacity. And when you try to take that and put it on another one that hasn't yet went through that same process, it causes it to tear. And then Jesus said, likewise, no one puts new wine, brand new wine, into an old wineskin. Or else the new wine will burst and the wine will be skilled and the wineskin will be ruined. Verse 38, but new wine must be put to a new wineskin. Then they're both saved and the wineskins are preserved. Verse 39, and no one, look at this, this is important because Pastor Brad didn't say this, Jesus did. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires the new. For he says, old is better. You know why? The old has already went through the process. The old is already intoxicating. You don't have to work a lot to get a drunk off the old buzz. Come on, somebody. It's what's familiar. 
It's what's already been established. But, but Jesus said nobody, when they drink new wine, they immediately say the old is better. But in the miracle of Canaan, here's what Jesus said. The, the, when Jesus is ministering to them, the people at the wedding feast said this. They said, you have saved the best for last. Now I want you to notice that in both Jesus' parable and in the story of the first miracle of Christ, in order to stay true to the biblical passages, I do have to tell you that this is talking about the Old and the New Covenant. Jesus is talking about the, the Old Testament way of doing things has come to an end. The new wine of the Spirit of God is here. It's different. You've got to receive it. And they wouldn't receive it. And what did Jesus say? New wine must be put into a new wineskin. Why? Why? Because an old wineskin has already stretched to capacity. It's already become hard, old, brittle. And if you put anything new in it, when it starts to stretch, it can't stretch with it. So what happens? It bursts. So Jesus said, don't do that. Because if you do that, you won't be able to preserve. Now, how many of you are ready to go to a deep place? You ready? All right, just a few people. How many people give me five minutes? Let me see your hand. Five, 10, 15. We can be here all day because I, you're going to give me what I need. Hallelujah. Here we go. I believe we serve an old school God. Now let me explain what I mean by that. He never changes. But the way He moved in the past, He still moves that way today. He still heals, delivers, saves, set free, all those things. He, he's an old school God, but He desires new wine in a new generation. Come on, somebody. He desires new wine in a new generation. And here's what you have to understand. You saw those pictures of the tent revivals. You saw the laying on of hands. And we hear about those miracles. That's great. But I refuse to live my life driving while looking in the rearview mirror. I'm like believing like what Jesus said. The best is yet to come. And if all God's going to do has happened in a previous generation, beam me up, Scotty, I'm ready for the rapture. But let me tell you something. If he's still got work to do, I want to be in the middle of it. I want to be in the middle of it. And whatever price it takes, that's what I want to pay. We serve a God who never changes. And his process never changes. I want you to go on a journey with me. My pastor taught me this some years ago. Wrote, wrote some notes down. He learned from going to a winery in, in Jerusalem on one of his trips to Israel and saw how they made wine and the rabbis were talking and I found it was significant. So I want you to go in here with me because God's process for new wine is the same for every generation. Are you ready? How many of you want new wine? How many of you want God to fill you with His purpose? All right, let's go. Let's look at this. The very first thing. Number one, the grapes were wanted. The vine dresser, the, the, the husbandman, is looking around in his vineyard. And he's trying to see if there are any grapes who are ripe unto harvest. And while the grapes don't all grow at the same place, there are some maybe that have not caught up yet. So he, he, he walks over those and he finds that which is right. And I don't know if you know this or not, but grapes don't grow high up on trees like bananas do. They grow on vines down close to the ground. So the, the vine dresser would have to reach down and pick up a grape and decide if he wanted to use this grape. Aren't you glad that the Bible calls Jesus our vine dresser? John chapter 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Aren't you glad that when he searches over our lives and he decides that he wants to use us, he looks where we are and he looks past maybe some things that aren't ready and he reaches down and he picks us up. Come on, somebody. Aren't you glad that he wants you? 
I'm here to tell you today that if you're here, you're not here by accident. You're not here by happenstance or coincidence. If you're here, God wants to use you. He wants to use you in His process. He wants to use you for His purpose. He reached down and picked you up and lifted you up to Himself. That's good stuff right there. That's just the beginning of the process. The next thing the vine dresser does when he finds a grape that he wants and he examines the grape, the next step in the process is he washes it. The grape is washed. Because it would not be a wisdom to take the grape that had been laying on the ground and the dirt and the dust and to put it into a pure place where uh, a, a drink is going to be made and mix dirt and contaminate all of those things. So the vine dresser, after he finds what he wants, he washes it. He takes the purest of water that he can find and he dips it over and over again and he washes it to get all of the impurities off. Can I tell you something? That if you want God to use you in a new wine type of revival, not only does He want you, but He wants to wash you. You can't be used by God if you still have all the dirt of the world in your life. Come on, somebody. There's still something called holiness. And without holiness, the Bible said, no man shall see the Lord. Listen, we stand in His holiness. I understand that. But He also washes us with the Word. He purifies us as a bride unto Himself. And if you're going to be used by God, my friend, you've got to be washed. You've got to be washed. The reason why some of you can't be used of God is because you've got too much stuff in the world that you're hanging on to in your life. There's some dirt that He wants to blast and pressure wash off of you so that He can use you for what He wants to do in your life. But you've got to first allow that pressure, that purpose to wash over you. And how do you do that? The Word of God washes us. Uh, but this process still ge keeps getting harder and harder. Because not only is the grape washed, but it's the painful part. The grape is wounded. Because after he gets the dirt off of it, he puts it up in a cylindrical type vat, a press. And oftentimes, as gross as it may sound, cleans his own feet uses his feet to press the wine until what's on the inside is released on the outside. You see, the valuable part of the new wine process is not really what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. And, and, and I hate to break it to you, but God can't really use you until He crushes you. God can't really do great things in your life until the weight of His pressure crushes us and reveals what's on the inside of us. It's not a comfortable place for a grape to be. It's really not a fun place to be when you're going through the process. But you have to go through the process in order to get the prize. The grape is wounded, but listen, why does he not use a stone roller? Why does he not use something of more pressure? I'm going to tell you why. Because when the grape is wounded, not only does it release what's on the inside, but it also reveals the seed. The seed is the ability to reproduce. The seed is the purpose. The seed is the DNA. See, Genesis chapter 2, God said, go into all the earth and have dominion. He said, every seed I've given you, every herb, it re reproduces after its own kind. And there's something about the seed that the vine dresser knows that he has to be careful not to put too much pressure. Because listen, if he crushes the seed, it causes bitterness to be released into the product. And can I tell you something? That when God has got you in His process, when God is trying to use you, God will crush you, but He will not allow you to be crushed past the point of being useful. He will protect the seed that's on the inside of you. Come on, somebody. 
Even Jesus had to go to Gethsemane before he went to the cross. I'm telling you that before you get to the next thing God has for you, before we get to the next thing that God has for us, we have to go through a crushing. There's a price that has to be paid. The grape was wounded, but the seed was preserved. But he doesn't even stop there. Not only was the grape wanted and washed, and wounded, but number four, the grape was winnowed. Winnowed is an old agricultural type, farming type turn. It is where we use a threshing floor. And they take a strainer and they take the flesh of that grape and the skin that's left over after the juice has been pressed out and they use a winnower to separate it. And how do they separate it? They shake it. What happens in the process is the flesh of the grape is separated from the fruit of the vine. And can I tell you something? That before God really can use you in His process, God has to not only wound you, but He's got to winnow you. He wants to remove some flesh off of your life. There are some things that you can't carry into a new wine season. There are some things that you can't carry into a move of God. You've got to remove some flesh out of your life. Come on, somebody. That old attitude's got to go. That old mindset's got to go. That old way of treating people's got to go. That old way of thinking has got to go. When God gets a hold of your life, He'll winnow you in His process causing that which is useless to be washed away from that which is useful. Can I tell you, it's painful when you're wounded and you're winnowed. But what I think is almost as worse as those things is number five. And this is not the correct word, but because it's my sermon, the grape was weighted. It was processed and then it was set aside for a little while. While the wine dresser prepared the wine skin. Whew. See, what you don't understand is when God is preparing you, He's also preparing the place for you to be. Can you imagine knowing that you have purpose, but you're hidden? Can you imagine knowing that you have a, a, a destiny from God upon your life, but He puts you in the waiting game? Nobody likes the waiting game. When you're hidden in obscurity and all of a sudden nobody knows who you are, I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus was hidden for 30 years to only show Himself for three and a half. Because He was under the process of God. Paul, after he was converted, disappeared for a little while and learned of Jesus. Waited. John the Baptist, in the wilderness, waited. Friend, I want to tell you, there's wine in the waiting. There's wine in the waiting. What you see as a curse, God sees as a blessing. What you see as painful, God sees as processful. Listen, He's trying to get you to learn to wait on Him because while you are waiting, God's process is working. So what do you have to do? You just have to be faithful while you wait. Because while you're waiting, the wine dresser is finding a wine skin. When he finds what he wants, he takes this new wine that's not yet been fully fermented that they would use throughout the year and dilute down. He would take this wine and its full potent strength and he would put it in this wine skin and what he would do is he would put it to the side and then when process started happening and expansion started happening, it began to expand. And because the wine skin was new, it was able to flex. It was able to expand. It was able to make room. Everybody say, make room. But Jesus was careful to say that you can't put new wine in an old wineskin. Why? Because it'll bust it. Because it cannot go any further. Friends, can I submit to you this morning? 
That in order for us to experience what God is doing today, and what God is doing in our own lives and what He desires to do, we have to make sure that we maintain the flexibility in our spiritual life. Come on, somebody. We have to make sure that we maintain a flexibility so that God is able to pour out. Because I don't believe that the winemaker, which is our Lord, I don't believe that He wants to waste what He's got doing in the earth right now by pouring it in to somebody like me who wants to criticize about it and complain about it because it doesn't look like the way it was when I was a kid. Come on, somebody. My prayer is, God, don't let me be one of those people who complain about the next generation. God, don't let me be one of those people who's always fighting what you're doing. God, I don't want to be where you were. I want to be where you are. And let me give you a nugget of truth this morning. You don't have to commit adultery to backslide. All you have to do is stand still and dig in your heels while God keeps moving. New wineskin. Because there's a move in the making. I want to tell you something right now as we get ready to close. My prayer is God make me a vessel. I've had an old song stirring in my spirit the last couple of days as I've been studying on this. Oh, you don't want me to do that. I told you in class I know what my gifts are. But that old song simply says, Lord, prepare me. It's an old chorus. To be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. You know what that, that prayer is in that song? Lord, make me a place where your spirit habitates. Stretch me to a place where I can learn about you. Let me tell you something. Let's all stand this morning. I don't consider myself to be really that old. I guess if you look at it from the biblical standpoint of 70 or 80 years by reason of strength, I guess I'm halfway there. I just don't claim I'm over the hill yet. And I'll tell you, my kids coming up, some of the things they listen to get on my nerves. Can I get an amen from somebody? Serious. I just don't like it. But I got to be honest with you. That's okay. Because my parents didn't like my music. And their parents didn't like their music. And vice versa. You know that when, when, when traditional Southern Gospel quartet harmony music hit the church scene, people fought it because they said it sounded like a honky-tonk? Because the tune of Amazing Grace, which is a beautiful song, the melody and the timing all was taken from a secular song and they just put new words to it. tell you, one of the quickest ways to lose the new wine is to not flex. No one when he drinks the old or no one when he drinks the new immediately says that the old is better. Why? Because you're instantly intoxicated by what you're familiar with. Here's what I know to be true. God wants to do something in the earth today. I've been saying this for years. I had a vision about it years ago, a couple years ago, and I shared it with you guys. I had a vision of, of, of like old wagons all over the prairie, all up northwest Oklahoma, having tent revivals like they did in the old days when there was no 
churches when there were no facilities and people were coming and they're being healed like, like they did with Jack Coe and A.A. Allen and, and Oral Roberts and, and R.W. Shambach and all those things. I, I, I saw that and I'm like, Jesus, that's amazing. But friend, that's not just a dream. That's a possibility. That's a reality. But listen, just because I had a dream about that, listen, God speaks to us in things that we can understand. Just because I had a dream about that, I don't expect us to go back to wagons and seeing that type of thing. But I turn on the news. And I see a hippie looking guy named Sean Fouch or however his name is. And he's got thousands of young people worshiping on the beaches of California in Central Park in Times Square all over America. And I'm thinking... Could this be like the Jesus movement of the 70s? When Keith Green and some of these other people emerged and, and, and they were tired of religion as usual. They were tired of people talking about a God they couldn't demonstrate. Tired of talking about a God that they acted one way on Sunday but they didn't love their neighbor on Monday. Could it be that they were tired of it so they, they started a revolution? Church, I'm telling you today, I want the new wine. I want the latter rain and the former rain together. And I'm closing with this verse today. The prophet Haggai, you can bow your head, close your eyes with me. The prophet Haggai said this, he's, do any of you who are present remember this house in its former glory? And they begin to talk about the temple. And Haggai said, I'm telling you, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Because friend, listen, God doesn't work in rewind. He's a present God. Come on, let me ask you a question. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me ask you a question. Those of you in this room, how many of you would it just thrill your soul to see God wreck an entire generation for Jesus? And by generation, I don't mean a certain age. I mean the people who are alive today. You, you're in that generation. How many of you would it thrill your soul to see God wreck an entire generation like He did at Azusa Street? To where people have to be carried home and put in bed because they can't speak in English for like three days because they're under the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm talking about where people come in with, with uh, drunken uh, you know, DNA and they, they are addicts and, and they come in one way and they leave changed by the power of God. Come on. I, I don't want to just sit at the table when I'm old and talk about these stories like they're a hundred years in our past. I will talk about what happened last night. What happened this morning. What happened at church today. That God's still moving and He's still all powerful. Come on, if that's you and you want to see that in our generation, lift your hand. I'm going to ask you to build an altar today. Before I do, if you're in this place and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you what, He gave His life on Calvary for you. And if you don't know Him today, you have an opportunity to give your life to Christ. The weight of sin of the world can be lifted off of your shoulders and you can leave this place today a new creation. If you're watching online or you're here in this room, you would say by the showing of your hand or by a response in the chat below, let me tell you, if you need to know that Jesus is the Lord of your life and you want me to pray with you today, I want you to raise your hand. Come on, lift it up high. I'm going to look for you. You need to know Jesus today. Hallelujah. I'm going to wait one more moment. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Here's the next thing that I want to do this morning. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I just don't know that I can flex anymore. Ask the Lord to make you a new wineskin. 
Come on. If He can give a sinner that has a stony heart a new heart, He can take an old wine skin and make you a new one. Today, I'm going to ask you to consecrate yourself to God and find a place of prayer. And we're going to pray together for a moment. And if that's you today, you say, Pastor, I want the new wine of the Holy Spirit in my life, in our church, in our young people. Come on, I understand it may not look like me, sound like me, talk like me, dress like me, but it's the same God who does not change. His same deliverance that is still real. His still baptism power that changes people's lives. Come on. If you just want to see God change with no strings attached, then come on, I want you to find a place to pray right now.